Now, because the interface is saying to do that, so we take the flow block of the bar and we only do it to do the full JPOG. You can take off the full JPOG back. So you have a deep full JPOG or a shallow flow block. You need to be an hour extra blood bar in the cut out to keep the power. So we only have a range of adaptability here for the blood bar to add more power to this interface. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm going to be the lowest um, specification. Um, we're going to be the first time to do this. So, I'm going to be the lowest specification. So, I'm going to be the lowest specification. So, I'm going to be the lowest specification. So, I'm going to be I'm not going to put in the uh, on the deep rack where I'm going to go like 71 or four dimensions in the rack. It could be easy to put in the face of the front bar. Now, uh, how do you control that? So, put the data main here on the computer scene from the top. This is the equipment interface. Data main is uh, has a tag on the working end as well. It's the computer scene, same plan, same plan. And the base frame, the working end is engaged. Have slots here, uh, this is the data main, the data X. Uh, the data max is a slot which the first bar came settles into a map. It appears to be a dimension which we can show the appears to be a dimension out in the field of 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 the Stop here. This is the not in the first bar in the data the data max, the data max, the data max. That's what really it's going to be straightforward at the bottom. The at the top interface here is slightly different, and as you're using to, that's, uh, that's where it becomes a bit more challenging and um, a bit more development work to have to, have to take place for ourselves. 
So again, yeah, stick fix in the same manner as the lower with two M6 click on the screw, secure the five meter meters. Uh, we have the back interface uh, and, and the close bar interface. Uh, the PSMs are there, 179.3 for adding additional bus bars for more power if required. Uh, it is more challenging at the top because of the uh, we have the coding there and the complaints and so on. It's not like the PSA. It's the main point of um, the discussion here and asking the uh, ECAPs and uh, uh, the community on what the problem is moving forward. So we can uh, the rear view of the rack so and other support for the first bar as well as at the top and the bottom how it's in the face of the rack. We have a central support brace on, on the throw box. What we found on the uh, 48 blocks, um, what we can actually produce is the power shell is fitted at the top and bottom. Um, during ASTM testing, ASTM 4169 transportation testing, we found a bit of a plastic deformation. Not to the buzz bar itself, but to the whole buzz bar assembly. Um, so, we had to move some supports in the center to where it was, uh, the power shape was engaged with the buzz bar to get that extra support there in short pass and the testing. But this interface would um, be common throughout the rack structure. So, the rack structure would be able to be fit that brace top, middle, or bottom, depending on whether it's a 12 volt or 48 volt buzz bar. But again, common. And again, this brings up a question about the post bar in, uh, to, the, to the community. Uh, we currently have a full height post bar, 12 volts, uh, upper power zone, lower power zone. Um, and is there any demand for a, a half <coughs> uh, post bar in the future? So, we've got a lower half of the rack with a, with a high power area and maybe uh, a not so high power zone in the, in the upper portion of the rack. <laughs> yeah, it does. That's it. Yeah, yeah. There's a cost associated to that, course, but that's it. That's needed. That's right. Yeah. I need it. Yeah. That's right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I stated at the top, um, we do have a few uh, challenges to look at how the top engages, and we still need to fit the load bar actually physically into the rack. Um, at the bottom, this control appears to be, as I said, at the top, you get a uh, general tolerance stack up due to foaming. Um, this can you know, add that cumulative tolerance, so that needs to be looked at. Now, if um, the bus bar is always to be fitted at the rack manufacturer's location, then that's not an issue. Um, you know, during the manufacturing assembly, the bus bar will be fitted in the location using a jiggle fixture to exactly control that bus bar location. However, if the bus bar is to become a complete standalone item and um, ordered by the customer, whoever that may be, separate from that, then we need to look at that bus bar to rack in place and how it engages to ensure we, we meet the OCP specification for the equipment in place to the bus bar and make sure that's controlled. That can be controlled by uh, you know, supplying the bus bar if it's only standing in the jig, in place on the power shelf, uh, we'll take it to the bus bar and then. Position. Or we can look at the piercing at the top to um, change the piercing into the back in place to the same as we do at the bottom. So we have again pierce to pierce edge and location plate to ensure we get that accuracy. So for the, um, for the community, really in general, the main questions I have are is the first part of the use separately to the back? Do you see there's any real demand from, uh, from the marketplace? Or any desire to actually order a buzz bar in the future to do any upgrades, or it always be really supplied as part of the rack when the rack is ordered. Um, also, it's, uh, then the next is the potential for a half height buzz bar. Is it really needed, or just got full height after full power of that? Well, I also do two half height buzz bars. Okay. So, so, yes, there are plenty of demand. I've lots of racks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, we took a Facebook, you have the upper zone uh, and the uh, lower, lower zone, split the two zones. The first part I sent, the first part came to send me a set of one piece. Um, I just envisioned whether there's any, any demand for like a half height complete contained 
Uh, I, I mentioned 50 today. Yeah. And, and I'm shipping more. Yes, I buy half half rack twenty OU bus bar assemblies from Emerson. Okay. Now we're okay and attach them to open bridge racks. Yeah. Okay. Again, this is uh, we talked about the, the bus bar drive interface and uh, the bus bar specification. This is what we were talking about. We would bring that in, into that as well and define that half by the Well, we've already defined it on that open bridge rack. It's already there. It's already done. The yeah, okay, so we have to uh, we have to marry that that uh, those features right up with with the specification, right? Well, to see that they're compatible. Really, I mean, it's it's attached using horizontal three horizontal horizontal mounting position. So and the same mounts work for both full high rack bus bars and half 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 rack. Solution twelve or forty eight when they are. I'm shipping 12 volt right now, but, but there's no reason why it, you couldn't use the same brackets to support a 48 volt bus bar because they have the same uh, volumetric outline in the rack specification. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, ideally, right, we'd use the same one for both yeah. on the mechanical side, right? And while the electrical are very. Are you going to the right data mode? The bus bars only need to be located relative to the X data. They don't need to be located relative to the A data. The, the, yeah, the A datum is important, right? Because that that really is what controls the ability of the connector to grab onto the bus bar, right? Is the 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 feature right now that keeps the chassis in the rack is whatever latch or something that's pushing against that A datum. So if that was too far forward, right, you can imagine putting in the chassis and it sliding forward till you hit the A datum and disconnecting in the back. So there okay, but but, um, but also the, that X that X I'm assuming is the front edge of the lamps, right? The, the, uh, the shelves of the right? So that's the limit of back travel. Um, so what, you wanna look at that real quick? Is that Derek, what, yeah. what was it? What was the X? So the X on, on my sketch was the it's where the buzz bar cage assembly interfaces into that. It's a desktop. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, yeah. You, don't, you don't have to zoom in on the rear. In the rear, there's there's those there's those lances that come out, right? Yes. And then there's usually tabs on the trays that go across and sit on the L brackets that plug into those. And the front edge of that lance is the other critical part and the distance from that that to the bus bar is, is really at least in my experience, is the critical thing. Yeah, yes, you don't want <laughs> the distance from that if that's X from there to A is important for not letting the cookie come loose from the bus yeah. bar. But that's a rack problem, not a bus bar problem, mm -hmm. in my estimation. The, the bus bar only needs to be relative, located relative to that that rear lens, which should solve some of your stack. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean you really <laughs> have to have both, right? The, you, the distance yeah. between X and your, your hard stop in the back is what keeps it from destroying the bus bar going back too far. Mm -hmm. And A is what keeps it attached. Yeah, so, so the, the node is going to attach to the tray. The tray is going to attach between X, to between the uh, hard stop and A. Mm -hmm. right, so he's proposing a new a new datum, right? Would it be yeah. X yeah. that would be controlled relative to Either A or the, or the hard stuff. You could do it either way. Exactly. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. However, it works better for the tolerances. I mean, yeah. Well, you know, it, I mean, given that the X the X data with the lenses is in the rear where you're going to attach the bus bar, it's for the control. Right? They're closer to each other, right? You'd have to tell yeah. me whether. Well, to be honest, it, um, it's, uh, it's the first thing to say is that uh, it helps you slot gears again, and that slots gears directly in line with the lats. The same thing as like. Yeah. 
everyone has a different style. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know about the uh, to talk about it, but it's more specific in the detail. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the first part position of blocks um, shouldn't have any impact um, in the engagement of the equipment. I think the first part should be that way out. So, what? Um, well, I'm saying more like, okay, so we have to put the holes exactly what this guy says. Say the knees, the top of the inside is muscle, and then that goes under for it. So that's like that. Yeah, we can just go back to detail and find where you can get the Did you want to? Talk, did you get a good answer to this first one again? Um, yeah, so uh, we talked about the halfway first part, which I didn't mention prior there, but um, we see the need where the, the uh, customer will actually be ordering a, a first bar uh, specific on its own right around rack in space. You know, um, it will always be supplied as, as part of the rack. So you can standardize and make it common across. Um, Across a platform interface, um, but do we need to kind of control the dimension from the post bar to the, uh, to the rack interface um, outside of the manufacturing environment of the rack is assembled? Will the customer have you know, hey, just a post bar? That's the whole premise of the open grid rack design. I think you can buy it today and then to and tomorrow you can convert it, and then you'll have to buy a bus bar separately. So, yeah, already, already been there, done that, have a stack already. Yeah, I think it's a Maybe repairs. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Because of the, 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 the much of the current control that we have, it's a big question of repair. Yeah, yeah. Good replacement and so on. Standard. It's on the same page. The spec's been there for years. Yep. The, the, the spec for the, the file is there, right? But there's not a there's not consistency between what Open Bridge is doing, Open Rack is doing, and what CG19 is doing, right? So we as a community all need to agree on one thing and then go forward, whatever that is. I don't know if Right, so I mean, the stuff that's already out in the field, right? Whatever we pick is probably not going to be compatible with, right? So, probably do a sheet metal bracket, something to backwards compatible. That that's the only possibility, right? But we, it, it, we're not going to be able to, you know, bridge that until we decide on something, and then we'll call that whatever that is, right? And then going forward, everything from that point forward, if you were to comply with that, would then be before it's backwards compatible with the, the new bus bar standard. I think standardizing the interface to say is a sort of press back and relatively um, you know, to do that. Uh, we could agree to that and bring that to the specification. But as you, uh, as you mentioned there, it's then about the, the 
configuration and where the power shares get fitted and uh, how that knock on effect the first bar, which uh, brings in a lot more variance. Just going to talk about uh, it's, uh, presentation. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's it. You guys come up. We'll get you. You can right there. Turn on. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to drive for us? Yeah, I'll be happy to drive. We don't have all the animations like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That might be All right. Okay. Let rip. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Knott. I'm an applications engineer for Anthenol uh, Power Solutions. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the 48 plus bar that we have uh, for the OCP community. Um, go to the next slide. Oh. With us is also. Mike Wingard, I'm the field applications engineering manager for our power solutions group. So some of the topics that came up are some of the things that kind of lead into our presentation here. Um, shown is the rack here with nine bus bar segments. I think this might be a carryover from some of the wallet solutions, but um, we've been moving forward with just a singular top to bottom vertical rail. Um, have the opportunity to do three, but the conversation that we want to talk about is, is there really a need for this to be split up? Um, maybe it's going to be a mixed mode, a 12 volt, 48 volt. Maybe it's going to be so large that it's above the 36 kW that we're seeing now, and there's, there isn't enough mass in, in the assembly to get that much copper for the amount of power that we're talking about. So um, I'm probably going to ask that question over and over and over again because I don't, uh, we have a feel that 36 kW something right now in the OCP community, but we're seeing from customers out there as high as 100 kW in a single rack. And the amount of space that we have in, in the area for the bus bar to be, that's a bit of a challenge for us to do without splitting. So um, that falls under the power requirements. Uh, we have a 15 kW and a 36 kW solution right now. Uh, we are looking at 42 OU racks, and we're also looking at 48 OU racks. Um, Locations of the power supplies we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, the locations of where to mount this bus bar. So, like I said, we're working with Rital, and that's given us an opportunity to locate how we're going to mount our bus bar. But uh, we've been having difficulty, particularly in the 12 volt space, integrating our solution because everybody's mounting location is different. So, uh, the standardizing, like like we had seen in the Rital uh, presentation, will make some of the slides I'm going to show you a little bit later. Um, so if you could go to the next one. Sure. Um, so I said 30, 15 and 36 kW. Uh, that's either just a, uh, a very flat uh, bus bar or an extruded profile to get us up to 36 kW in the space that we have. But we're seeing some applications as high as 100 kW. And what we're doing with that is we're taking a 50, uh, 50 kW rated extrusion and cutting it in half. So it's really dual, uh, dual 50 zones. Uh, we think we can get up to 60 with the extruded profile space that we have. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we think that that's going to be the limit. Uh, so the single 60 zone or the dual 120 kilowatt zone. Uh, the 50, like I said, is, uh, excuse me, the 100 is dual uh, 50. Uh, so we kind of brought out uh, a bit of a chart here on, on what, what, what we're actually seeing right now. For us, we don't really see a difference in the bus bar from shallow to, uh, to a deep. Bus bar is going to be the same either or, but 15, 36, 50, and 60 kilowatt ratings are what we're uh, focusing on right now. The um, the attachment method right now in the uh, in the bus bar is three positions for, for lugs. Right now, that seems to be uh, sized up to about three, four op wires. We feel that if we are going to max out that space and go up to 60 kilowatt, 
we may not have enough room to bring all, the, all that power. So if we're using a bus bar, we can put more bus bar there, but if we're gonna continue with the cabled method, method we're, we're maxed out now at 36 kW with the, the three four out wires. At least on the current spacing. Uh, one of the points of consideration is either adding more threaded uh, studs and maybe also spacing them out so we can bring larger wire into the area. So have you looked at that to see what might, might be best? Well, we think that bus bars would make the most sense to do. I think we've talked about maybe having blind meat connectors as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so far, there isn't a connector that does that. Uh, so cabling's easy. People can do that. Bus bars take a little bit more to develop, but um, uh, we think that bus bars is the way to get there. If you're going to continue with cables, we need more lug landing positions. Okay. So yeah, we can. I mean, right now you, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see you've got. I guess three right now. The next step above that is the, the three by three array. Um, so we can certainly look at adding, you know, leaving it at two, right, and just adding more positions down, however many you need. Yes. Um, right. We want to look at uh, you know, where we're going with the power. Yep. And then see what size we need, and then we can come back with a more uh, solid recommendation. Okay. Power, the power supplies right now are larger are smaller than this space is right now. So it would extend down and further our use space. Okay. Um, so the challenge that we have with the bus bars is, is this complicated matrix of how we're gonna develop um, for each and every customer. Um, the bus bar profile, the installation is pretty, pretty standard for us now. Um, the stack up of how we get our bus bar and cross sectional wire to the copper is pretty well defined. We're having the most challenge in being able to associate it to a specific rack. We just have a handful of rack members here, just a handful, but clearly there's a lot more. And for each and every type of mounting, until we standardize, we're going to have a different part and we're not going to have the ability to pull just an OCP 48 volt bus bar by part number. It's going to be specific to each and every rack manufacturer. Um, we still expect there to be the difference in wattage. We're finding customers want their rack tailored towards what their power requirements are. There's uh, at, at hyper scale, there's enough, there's enough savings with between 15 and 20, whatever, uh, excuse me, and so on in terms of that pocket savings with the, with the bus bars. But um, we'd like to get down to maybe uh, just a single point of mounting locations for, for the bus bars. So why didn't you put open grid rack? Because I think we're learning that we didn't penetrate very well into the 12 volt space, so I think that was unknown to us. I mean, we came into this after working with connectors on the 12 volt side, but we didn't really have much, we didn't put that much effort into the 12 volt system, so we just we didn't have that knowledge. And you're saying it's as simple as clicking a few things, and it was, it was hard enough to find that we didn't. But, um, well, we certainly had lots of personal meetings about this. About the rack. About the like, yeah, for sure. In general, I mean, I mean you're no strangers to my office. Um, you know, you, you visited multiple times. You talked, like you said, about lots of different things. I, 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 I don't think we ever looked at being the bus bar supplier for you. Um, maybe Mike can correct me on that. But, uh, we had discussions about that, too. We had discussions, but we haven't gone beyond discussions. Yeah. We never got to do it, but it didn't mean I wasn't going to be doing 48 volt. But I think what we've talked about is common mounting because positive and negative 48 we've talked about quite a bit, and mm -hmm. a similar rack maybe top and bottom. So um, it belongs on there. This bridge rack work belongs on this list for sure. Okay. Yeah, this certainly does not cover every option that's out there. This covers the bulk of the major <coughs> options that uh, as bus bar suppliers would cause us to have unique uh, bus bar supplies for each of our customers, depending on what combination of events that they uh, selected. So we would love to wipe off this entire end here. I mean, <laughs> um, the way that we manufacture is there's typically tooling involved for sheet metal manufacturing and things like that. So we're as much as possible because uh, cost is definitely driving the success of the system. So.
um, power zones. So um, the topic of power zones is important when we're when we're rating a bus bar. Um, a 36 kW single large copper bus bar is going to be more expensive than an 18 watt cut in half that you can also call a 36 kW. What we've seen most often is that it's the rack that's defining what the, the rating is going to be, and it's not by the bus bar itself. So when you have a single power zone, you've got much more mass of copper. We just we want to be very clear that when we're competing out there for this bus bar business, um, that we're talking the same language. When, when, we're, when we're filling the rack, we want to make sure we're saying the same thing. So uh, when we talk about a power zone, that is the single point of contact that the, comp that the, the copper bus bar is making to the power supply. Um, in an instance where there is two power supplies and the copper bus bar is rated at half of what the rack is. So, uh, a single 36 kilowatt power uh, zone will have more copper than two 18s. It's pretty self explanatory. Question on that? Oh, yeah, that's what I was going with. Yeah. So, yeah, if you put the power supply in the middle, you get the same effect. So, you don't have to know. So, this is a way that we found around this particular one. Um, but not everyone is, is, is locating their, their power supplies in the middle of the rack. Um, I'm not a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, not, 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 not everyone. No, no. We're not the ones that can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone's here from that. Uh, but yeah, uh, top or bottom is actually where we started with the 36 k And not centrally located. Um, actually, let me see that uh, slide again. Um, no, it's okay. So this is a, a comment. Um, I think it's a carryover from the 12 volt spec when we talked about this. Uh, inside the OCP spec under 12 volt, there is the commonly used, um, it's, it's five amps per square millimeter for your cross-sectional area. Um, <laughs> No less than 3.5, I believe is what it says. So the question that I had for OCP was, can we carry this over in 48 volt because it's just under 12 volts right now? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there'd be any problem with that. We can certainly see. Uh, I mean, the, the one that's in the 12 volt isn't necessarily a requirement; it's just a recommendation. Yeah, that's that one. We can carry the recommendation over if that's the if that's the correct recommendation for 48 volt. I'm sure it probably is. Um, yeah, but we could certainly add that in. Yeah. This is our last slide. This is an issue that we see with the spec. Right oh, hang on. <coughs> Andy's got oh. that. Okay, you, in this case, you would like to say that I am commuting the square. But, as you know, okay, from the newer, typically the newer part, the fast part, the, the criteria is never reach up to the DSP for creative bus bar, or they never reach it up to 90 degrees C. Well, yeah, that's something important. This is with the 30 degree T rise. But you will never know how much the uh, customer working at this point. If you don't mind, before you answer this question, the question so that yeah, just so that people are not. So, if I understand the question right, the question was that. The, cu you, the customer. Maybe nowadays, okay, uh, some customers request a 40, 40 degree C, but maybe tomorrow another customer will come for a Is that ambient or T rise? Yes, that's my working ambient temperature. So, this so I would like to say that maybe the set of 5 amp per millimeter square, like current test is a little bit tricky or dangerous. It depends on. Plus the, the T rise request. Did everyone hear the question? Okay, so um, because we're not defining what the application will actually see in terms of temperature of 40, 50, 90, um, the, the question is that it could be a little dangerous to call out this cross sectional area and mm -hmm. define it to a, an amperage per, per cross sectional area. Um, I think that. The, the comment that I would make to that is... Um, um, analysis, in fact, analysis with, uh, OK, 
the knowledge there, but the world will win. When the world will power, the great power budget, more than the 35 or 36 kilowatt, sometimes customers already thinking about the liquid cooling or the, the some other some of the air, yeah. sure. Yeah. In that situation, sometimes the server, in some case, won't give you any air. Yeah. That will bring the fast bar temperature to more waves. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's why it's uh, for the 12 volt, right? That's why we just left it as a recommendation as opposed to like a hard requirement. Um, but again, we can use it as a recommendation. But well, it is careful. We have to be careful. I think what we found through simulation and load testing <laughs> is that it's a, it's a conservative enough number in the spaces that we're dealing with. Um, I mean, there's, there's instances where even 3.5 is written in the spec. For, so it can be less. We've just, we're suggesting this just based off of the data that we've captured throughout the years. So, um, but essentially, you're saying that's the number you use to rate the bus Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <coughs> so there's a touch group for the, the, the line that's, hit, that's highlighted here is uh, user access limited by method that conforms to UL 6950. Um, 6950, uh, what is it, um, it's like 2.1.1.1 has this probe that, that uh, simulates a finger. Um, these images here show that on, on either side of the bus bar, you can actually penetrate the, uh, the, the probe into the bus bar and it wouldn't comply with 6950 as written. So uh, at some point, these are going to be uh, tested assemblies. These are going to see UL uh, at some point. And this right now looks like a all right. Um, so, what's your what's your proposal for that? <laughs> We're probably too far down the stream to change the spec, so it could comply. It may have to do a different class or remove it because it is not a requirement on bubble. Where there's the mechanical considerations, of course, which we'll skip this. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what I mean, would it be simple enough just to move, you know, reduce the uh, chamfer slightly? You really only have to solve no, for the positive. Yeah, the, the one is pretty bad there. So um, well, the top one's ground, right? So that's not necessarily a problem. It's the bottom one that's it's barely touching. That's uh, the one that's hot. Probably two millimeters away. So I don't know how much chamfer there is there, right? But you do. Reduce the amount of chamfer on there. I don't know what that does to the, the gatherability of it, right? But we'll skip in terms of life of the connector. Is there any room to move that back? Is there? I'd rather not, only because we're real short on right now. I mean, white is tight from a connector manufacturing standpoint. Uh, we've got customers it's voice concern that the amount of white that's available doesn't meet their. Uh, we had customers uh, voice concern that uh, the amount of white that's available in connectors today uh, may not be sufficient. So moving that bus bar back farther uh, would require some design changes to the existing connectors. The other option, I guess, would maybe um, to shrink the area that's the opening there for the uh, with the bumpers. I mean, there, I guess there's a bunch of ways we can go about it. But Mike mentioned about the fact that it's not present on the 12. Uh, so that's one thing yes. you look at is the chamfer, there's some blue areas there now. I think it's quite generous. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure uh, that's required. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. I, I, that would be the first thing I'd look at, right? Because that would be a very simple modification right. um, that might, might get you to compliance very quickly. Okay. okay. We've got another two minutes if there's any more. Questions or no? Okay. Good. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot.
explain this really well. So Justin gave me a terrific uh, segue into the connectors. Uh, what's it up here? I just want to get some feedback, introduce a new connector, uh, mounting method uh, we use uh, after all it's come up with as an alternative to the existing design. So we have at Ethanol a uh, proven mounting method that removes hardware. Uh, we've used the connectors for years. We've adopted this method to the 48 volt uh, air connector. Uh, I also have a standard connector in my hand. You can see a screw and washer is required to provide these on the slope. That adds cross for installation, cost for hardware. Uh, so we introduced, we are introducing uh, a slide to lock version. Uh, it basically has a flip, goes in the panel, slides horizontally, snaps in place, no hardware, a little faster uh, labor. And uh, while uh, reducing those uh, manufacturing costs, it also obviously meets all the flow requirements for 19 gear, 40 volt 19 gear, uh, up to plus or minus two millimeters and X and Y. Uh, it does take up 23% less uh, panel space than the screw mount version. Uh, we've had a customer that's uh, extremely tight in their uh, in their mounting, and uh, so they did not have room for screws. Uh, it also, obviously, as I said, eliminates hardware and it's a tool free installation and removal. And we are planning to uh, ask the committee to add this uh, panel cutout uh, to the standard going forward. You can click on the video real quick. Sure. Just, uh, <coughs> no. and you may not launch. Let me see if this will get a shot again. Okay, no. no it's no, not going to launch. Nope. Yeah, no worries. So uh, basically, it was just a video of the connector that originally had this design that shows how it goes together. So this is the uh, calculation where I came up with 23% less panel space. Uh, obviously, the screw mount version, which is the standard product that meets IT gear or meets the open rack today, uh, is the standard footprint. And then on the right side is the new part. Uh, the existing screw mount connector uh, is wide and narrow, okay, in profile, whereas this part is more rectangular and vertical in nature. Uh, but uh, when I did calculate it out, the total area required is about 0.3%. So I'm just wondering, is there any, I'm looking for feedback, basically. Uh, this connector is designed for 100 amps uh, in and 100 amps out. And you notice that in the open rack, the vertical dimensions are not defined. So we've sized this based on a customer survey we've done, which is uh, right around, the, the largest one we've talked, the largest customer we've talked to so far is right around 75 amps, and they need headroom to 100. So we size the connector to that space. You're putting the one you can see, right? Correct. Yeah. And can it be mounted horizontal? They, sure. yeah. Google's original spec was that they would put the horizontal oh, uh, box. Box parts in parts. Oh, yeah. Is there a grounding option? To tap the ground? Uh, no, there's not. Because it's only a two pole connector. So there is no option at this point to uh, put uh, a ground on. That's great feedback. I haven't heard that. That's the question. Is, is that still in the spec from before? Um, I'm pretty sure it is. I'd have, I'd have to go, yeah, 48 for horizontal. For horizontal. Oh, the horizontal was round. Well, the, the, the ground, ground for the horizontal. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty, that hasn't been removed, so I'm pretty sure that's that was in there from the first. Okay. From the first submission. Yeah, certainly it will function sideways as well. Question Does it have a sense pin? No, it's not. Okay, uh, based on our trial or view experience, maybe the for comment of why the left for drive the protein disk and won't be so much. Okay, that's that's an easy solution. You just re reduce the size of the panel, uh, cut out, and the vector space is the same. Uh, the, the situation is uh, when we do some the the okay the the, the, the tray and it's not not out the protein dimension. Suddenly, when we try to insert the, the devices, 
maybe due to the too much protein distance, the connector will hit on the back edge. Right, real experience. Left or right, yeah. For vertical, it doesn't matter. But right. Uh, right. left or right, maybe we won't need. My personal fear is just the plus mass one in the Okay, that would help with the leading issue and the uh, touch group finger probe. Mm -hmm. uh, you can reduce the uh, leading. Any questions? Good. Unfortunately, I think I need more fluid, not less. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd rather see stick it too. Okay. To, keep, to keep the current requirements for flow. Yeah, yeah. They're they're selfish though because I've got three wide and I'm not I'm not lined up center line when I'm three wide, so I need to look to accommodate the difference between the center line. Okay. Yeah. So. I think in one of the specs, it says that the plug is there to accommodate the solid city. The plug is present so that you can tip on the, the gear in the rack and it, it accommodates the spreading and uh, contact degradation. So I guess I'm wondering is that why it's there? And it is two millimeters the right number. What is the right number? I haven't read that. I haven't seen that. Portion of the spec where it was the flow was in use for or is introduced for uh, shipping requirements. Uh, these are simply complied with the plus minus two millimeters requirement. Uh, I assume it was how it stacked up. Uh, there's a lot going on in there. Uh, as you said, uh, two millimeters, some customers may have, uh, some of our customers may have uh, need for every bit of that two millimeter uh, just in the mechanical uh, stack up. Well, certainly that would be a consideration of uh, addressing any kind of motion during shipping uh, with all that to do with it. My only fear would be, well, I guess we still have two millimeters of vertical as well. So yeah. uh, it would be addressed in the full point. Yeah. The, uh, the, the vertical is specifically for the transport. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. That's, otherwise, you really you wouldn't need that, that, right? But it's, yeah. it's for transportation with the gear installed is why you get the vertical. Okay. Um, so you can pick any number you wanted. It's just a matter of how stiff the gear is, right? And how bad of uh, a shipping environment you're exposed to. So we picked we picked two. So now that could be the right or the wrong answer, right, but it, right. it, it works for something. Yeah, it, it works for <laughs> most of the stuff that we've seen. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. All right, super, thanks a lot. Yeah, we're actually uh, three minutes ahead of schedule. Do you have a break built in? Yes, I do. I've got it right after this next 20 minutes. All right, so the next thing we have on uh, our agenda is uh, three suggested proposals for modifications to the. Um, oh, hang on. That's right, I can use this one. <laughs> Andy, Andy, why don't you come up? Andy, you're up next, so why don't you go ahead here? Um, so, Nick. Oh. All right. Um, the next thing we've got up are there's uh, uh, three proposals for modifications to the existing open rack B2.0 specification. So, one of these is uh, very minor modification changing the tolerance on the width of the copper from uh, 0.3 to 0.15, um, make it a little bit easier for the, the connector suppliers. Uh, does anybody have any issue with this change? All right, I said it's pretty unanimous, all right? Easy enough. Um, all right, Anthony, you're up for, uh, for the rest of these. Uh, yeah, I will. That one's all there is for this one. So I'm going to get the Delta one up real quick. And we'll 
copy and All right, go for it. Uh, okay, then, uh, ladies, <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, this my name is Anthony from Yota Electronics, Taiwan. Okay, uh, so now then maybe I would like to okay, share or post something. Uh, two things. First one is uh, okay, we're trying to have a modular dimension in the REX uh, standard. And second one, we're talking about the sound flexibility, the power size in OCP. Okay, in the 2.0 standard, we suddenly realize okay, that will be the 48 volt or 12 volt, and also the 32 inch or uh, or 42 inch or 30 inch the grid. So we suddenly we uh, realized maybe that will be more different the uh, grid type will be needed. Not only the two, maybe will be the 48 volt in the long version or the 12 volt in short version. So next page. So in this topic, maybe I try, I'm not trying to change the, any the physical size or design we have nowadays, but we're just trying to maybe we should uh, some systematize or some uh, well-organized the, the dimension in the OCT spec so we, the customer can easier the pick up of okay, what kind of the type they are exactly looking for. So in this page, we really, uh, the first important dimension is from the lucky point to the start point. This dimension drive or determines the, the record the full print size or the, your server, IT gears, or anything will be installed in red. So that will be the first thing. And next. Starting point to the okay the first start point maybe we call that the return point, but unfortunately it combines the two factors. So in here, Delta would like to propose we change this dimension, this area to become next page. Okay, more clearly, we define the we should define or determine specify the start point for the return point. Because that dimension is totally, in most of tests, it depends on the, the clean you are trying to use on your devices. So based on current situation, we have the 12 volt and the 48 volt, and we would like to propose the dimension is 3.8 and the 7.6. But actually it's not new. It's from the some current 2.0 spec, the calculations. Next. If we set this kind of the two metric, then we can simply get out the 40, 42 inch 12 volt and the other three type. That will be make the more well organization or the easy choice. Okay. Any question you can start any now. Okay. So next thing we're trying to propose something new. In nowadays, the power supply or power electronic power industry, the power density become higher and higher. In nowadays, okay, we, we already, for Delta, we already can have the, the 15 kilo, uh, 18 kilowatt in the one OU size. And also, so we can think about uh, 48 or 36 kilowatt. But unfortunately, in current OCP spec, the power type, the power connection point on the bus bar is not really well uh, suitable or uh, well systemized for the different size of the power share. So, back to this page. This we call the previously the top bus bar, and next, and 48 volt. This two dimension we already mentioned before. But we will also notice the sound must keep the clearest dimension. 
in Fort Diego, that will be the starting point for. The reason I highlight the dimension here is because okay, that we're trying to propose for the bus bar connection point for the different size of the power We must reserve the, the sound clearance space here just in case if that space you will install such high, for example, a 3 or you will power share, you can still insert your server or IT gear. But in case you need to the 3 three or you power share, you already have a connection point here. So that will be to give you a more flexibility. And next, that will be the port table. The same consideration, just keep the 40 millimeter clearance here, just in case no power share really is three or you have, but you can make the clip making without any trouble. But in case if you really have the three or you power share, oh, maybe that will give you more than 50 kilowatts, but the connection already here. So that's the something new maybe you will have that pose. Is 26 enough on the end of the green bus line because of the uh, end that side? I, I don't know if 26 is enough on the inside. I, I don't remember my numbers right off hand from a long time. I don't know if 26 is going to be enough to the front head to the center of the first hole in the inside of the bus part, between the two bus parts, because of the size of the end. So is, is 26 the what's in the current standard? No, it is more deeper. More, more, more deeper. Yeah, more but behind. No, it's more behind, but to get a server in there, I don't know. Like I said, I'd have to go back and look at my numbers, but the diameter of that pin nut, I want to say it's like 12 and a half millimeters or something. That would be a, 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 a yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah. But on the inside, when you press it on, I think it's, again, I could be off. But Anyway, there's a chamfer on that connector. Maybe, maybe it'll miss it. Oh, yeah. Some, some of you might want to look at it. In fact, uh, we'll put back more things. Because of the way to look at the uh, couple of things. Okay, actually, that only in the next one. That look on the inside. Look yeah. on the inside. The, the inside, where the nuts going to be. If you're doing it that way. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes. You're going to be under the yes. But, but in fact, in the trail, maybe the, that because that's the insert nut on the bus bar. So inner side will be right always. Nothing. Yes. Yes. Uh, some of the characters have pretty long arms on that, that may be the one that this is the point of the thing to do. Some of the, there are multiple different manufacturers of those connectors. Method has a 12 volt connector. Most of the old original style that has a longer tongue on it, I think. And tongue in the middle there is the deeper on um, methods, but other, yes. other designs from method. Yes, I can mm -hmm. see. But that's all we can have, or we just based on the older available clips. Okay, we find a dimension also to equalize some suggestions and the board here to make the bus bar. Or the power shift selection can be more flexible. I like your idea though. Okay, any questions? Thank you. All right, uh, we've got about a 10 minute break right now. So um, I guess we will start up again at 2.50. Yeah, two five zero. Um, I'm definitely going to put more water. Okay. Uh, uh,
So um, we, our last 30 minutes on the agenda today is to talk about that very thing, right? Okay. So from a power system standpoint, what are the specifications that uh, we need to go start working on, right? What is the community you want to go see? Okay. Um, we can start taking some of those. Right, yeah, we could start kind of filled out. We could start to listen to that. And, yeah. then, and then maybe over the next few weeks, figure out what we can do. Yeah.
Yeah. No. They're late to their own presentation. You can give it. Well, we'll just skip it and go on the next one. Come back. Maybe they got nervous. <laughs> you want to? Scott, I so. You said 250. Want to pay in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. I'm still missing my presenter. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're afraid to talk amongst yourself until we get. There's more people that want to talk. They're both here. I mean, so two presenters are missing. Well, those two for this one. Well, and let's move on to the next one. Scott is, yeah, I don't see Scott here. What about the one after that? 
next one is this discussion. Well, shoot. So, I've never had that one. I haven't either. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Paul Smith, and uh, I'm here co-presenting with Ed Fontana, who's just come paywall. Typical. Um, we would like to make a proposal for a three-phase, three-inch PC input. 48 volt DC power shell. And we see this as having some, some fairly significant advantages. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say about it. We, we submitted a specification, and I understand that it's been distributed. So we're hoping that uh, we're going to get some feedback on it as opposed to having to give you lots of numbers and details that uh, are not going to mean very much in, in, um, in, the, in the presentation form. Um, what we're going to look at is a true three phase input uh, having voltage range in the 380 and 480 volts for that AC range, 48 volt DC output. Power shell can be used and can be compatible with the uh, uh, standard version 2.0. Um, we're, we're looking at a two brand new shell, feeding it with either a single or dual 50 amp uh, whip core with a three phase connector. Um, I say one or two, that will depend very much on whether you want to do an A plus B feed or whether you want a single feed through the, the entire shell. Um, we'll be using uh, the bus bar clips and we just had a print discussion on that to verify that. So we can, in fact, get 550 amps out of two one new uh, bus bar clips. So we shouldn't need to use the bolt-on connectors, but the bolt-on connectors are, are an option. Uh, in terms of benefits, um, this really simplifies the AC wiring. You know, many data centers have three-phase AC already distributed around the, uh, um, the load area. Um, and using the whips just to plug into uh, existing uh, connectors is very, uh, very simple, very straightforward. Uh, no neutral is required. It does include uh, the safety. Um, basically, it's three conductors uh, plus the safety ground. Um, what you see when you use single phase fees is the intrinsic necessity to balance your load between phases. If you have a three phase feed, whether it be direct from the utility or from, more importantly, if it comes from, from the UPS, um, it's very important to balance the load between those, between those phases. And most operators will tell you that they have to do that. But if you use a three phase rectifier that automatically balances between those phases, you just plug in new loads, you don't have to worry about where you're plugging them because they all automatically balance the power that they take between those three phases. Um, for simple powering, uh, we're looking at something which will be um, 24 kilowatts in a two rack unit module, not more than one module in a, in a rack. And you can locate it vertically in the rack wherever you like, um, whether you've got a split bus, as we talked, mentioned earlier, or a, or a single bus. Um, you 
using the flip insertion of the, uh, of the PowerShell to allow you to do that insertion that you want. Um, and then we're looking at having the shelf also have uh, internet access either through SMMP or Modbus protocols uh, for building management systems for the Um, in terms of compatibility, it's designed to go into a um, two-rack unit uh, shelf in the shallow dimension. Um, showing again the, the, the clip on the back here, that's, that's really all uh, that, that shows. But the, the two, one or two, uh, whip cords for the AC input is, is good. What it would look like from the from the front side, we've got um, four modules in the two rack unit you know, plug-in uh, with feedback connection, monitoring, and control um, module on the on the side um, for controlling the power units. Then we get into some of the uh, some of the input line voltage parameters, and these are pretty standard. We come from a, a telecom background, so what you'll see here is a lot of references to some of the telecom audio specs. Nothing specifically uh, magical about that, they just happen to be convenient specs that uh, give you a very good, um, a good product for high reliability is evidence from the US telecom, telecom arena. So, so what we've done really, and some of these I apologize, there's a bit of a mixture uh, in some of these from the standpoint of the shelf level versus the individual, individual power unit level. Um, we have a current running, for example, we to get uh, 24 kilowatts out of 15 amp input. Um, so <laughs> that's at the module level. Um, and we've got some further, further specifications on the following slides. But like I say, unless there are specific questions that people Having seen this, uh, have um, I don't really want to get into every single one of the tools. I'm sure I'm really open it up for uh, for questions based on on either either the advantages of the specification as we probably will see. We should just proceed with it as is. <laughs> well, it's 48 volts, um, nominally 54.5, um, but the, the plan is to stick with the, uh, uh, the 2.0 DC output specification. Um, it's pretty standard battery charging voltages and currents. And, we're very familiar with that from the, from the telecom side, obviously, as a standard. 48 volts is so you can use it forever. Yeah. Well, it's less 40, it's plus uh, 48, and it's going to be able to 42. Right. Would you mind just repeating the question? Yeah, the question was whether it would be plus, plus 48, and plus we make uh, many products, and minus 48, it's just a matter of which side you ground. <laughs> Um, and, and the typical voltage range is from 42 to 58, typically, uh, depending on whether people want to do use charging or batteries or what have you. But uh, it can be, it can be uh, monitored and controlled remotely through the through the access. Uh, but the standard voltage is 54, and, and that can be modified depending on what your BBU. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't want negative voltage, you just turn it upside down. Now. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get us well Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. That's a new record. Nice, nice work.
So I don't see I don't see our next presenter in here either. So um, yeah, I can I can ping him real quick to see where he's at. So let's. Uh, no, why don't we? Let's do this. Let's take um, at least like a twenty-three minute break, right? So we'll start up again <laughs> at three. Yeah, at three thirty, and uh, I'll see if I can't roust up another presentation for you. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. So it'll be uh, three thirty. Three thirty. We'll still be ahead of schedule. Yeah, yeah, see you. Thanks for coming out. We'll be around. You probably have one in the base there. Yeah, there is. It's called DCD Hello Cloud or whatever. Yeah. And then the password is uh, DCD uppercase space 2017. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we have like
What's the next one? Uh, next one, no. The X is going to start with external. At the top. You're unmuted, so you can do that. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll, uh, we'll call an audible here real quick. All right, so since we're still running about 15 minutes ahead of time. What I'm going to do is propose that we just go ahead and jump into our power conversation. Um, and then, uh, then we can switch over to the Google once, once, uh, once they're around. Um, so right now we've got about 30 minutes kind of set aside to kind of talk about the power systems, which we've had some great discussion on so far. Um, I want to look at what other specifications um, is are currently missing, right, from the open rack of power project, right, that we do be interested in. Um, same creative. So this is, uh, if, you get, if you look at the open rack V2 specification that covers both 12 volt, 48 volt, it really describes mostly what's going on to the bus bar, just to tell you how it gets on the bus bar. Um, so we've seen some mechanical stuff here that we can maybe make some tweaks. Um, and then from there, um, we need to kind of look at, at filling out more of the electrical things that are currently not covered, right? For example, there's not a lot of choices right now on the um, on, on input, right? So if you look on what's been said so far, you basically get the 277 volt that Facebook uses. Um, and then we've heard from GE is proposing a 38480 AC. Um, so either what do you as a community want to see people working on, right? What would help you guys deliver products to your customers, right? Is there a particular 
uh, input type or type of uh, you know, number of rectifiers that's ideal um, that we really should be working on. Maybe we can get uh, kind of a form on what we need to go work on and we can get the people focused on delivering that particular product. So, um, this is kind of open ended discussion um, amongst yourselves, right? What would you like to go see? Sure. I was just wondering, uh, you know, seeing this discussion on, on the bus bars, to find the location, you mentioned the electrical side. I haven't seen, I don't know, other people do the same. How do you think it would be off this, you know, as we expand, you know, any rack and people put vendor A's power supplies, vendor B's power supplies, and, you know, how do you do the different sharing? So, you know, so I just wondering, so we set um, uh, discussion group around that, and it's talking about the digital sharing, talking about uh, the dynamic performance and other factors around that. Would that be a question? So are you, are you looking for interoperability? At the rack, at the rack level, between different manufacturer shelves, are you looking at interoperability within the shelf between different rectifiers within the shelf? So that's the question. I mean, the initial point to start would be within the rack. You know, suppose the vendor A, vendor B, or vendor C is stuck in there, and then keep the two shelves in parallel. How would they react from a sharing perspective, dynamic performance, transients? So this could be expanded beyond within two hours. From there, you can take another step down. Right. Yeah, so there are there are a couple things. One of the things that we we are going to offer is insight on the issues that we are seeing that um we can talk about. That's a that's a very good ask though. Sure. Thank you. That's all good. All good. So, so the idea is that um, we've been for a long time. We've got communities out there. Um, we're willing to bring that community and have that be a good place um, that would make the way our health and policy uniform across um, all of us. And that would allow people to, like, you can even have a brand new community. So, so that would give you leverage. Um, the other, other kind of question I have is okay, I'm coming from a It's not clear to me how this is part. I mean, I look at it occasionally, but when the when the when the controller comes out, I also control the battery. Um, that, that's how we're going to position it. And it's more easy. I feel like this one is the battery and backup is kind of a separate issue. And so that separation um, may be a stumbling block or may require more than just the context. Um, that is communication. So, <coughs> so, so, so defining the, the path, power, That's traditionally the way it's done. And I think from a scale 
don't need to have it doesn't have great oh you just add more here right so it's like not great it's something it is So, I mean, that's a good topic right there. If we were to set up a sort of uh, protocol, right, would it be important that it would be separable between the PPU unit and, and your power subsystem, right? That, that a feature that needs to be uh, scalable or separatable between those two, or is that something that we can lump together in one time? Yeah, I agree it's a good question, but I don't think it's um, uh, because uh, if they are separate, right, is there actually uh, an environment where you have one vendor's battery and one vendor's house pipe? We don't think that would work. So, uh, but it is worth mentioning, but I think going back to the demo, which is uh, we started off version two with some concepts about the and it seemed to get complicated with the solution was just not uh, and so that's just a hole. Right? So so yeah, we definitely can fill the hole. I know there was some interesting discussions early on, I guess it was last year at the last workshop. Uh, you know, some people were like, oh, obviously the only way to go is to send the key, it's logical. Other people go, no, no, that's ridiculous, it's already wrong. That seems wrong. Uh, that's the only way to do a whole thing. I think we're actually, you know, from our perspective, maybe uh, Ed is in the same boat, is that, you know, we do think SMP is a better way to do this in IT world now. Uh, you don't have to have an extra connection, it's just the one connection, the same switch, it's not a different product. Everything goes in the same network, uh, or can go in the same network as, as everything else. You don't get that key addresses, you're self negotiating from the whole time, you can set broad rates or anything else. One so, so I think you know we're again we're just going to ask the question that you know, we should put this in the standard, make SMP the standard, and uh, and then put a few details in there that allow us to, to then understand how it works. So is it if we just need to have a common bit file and then you can that as one follows? Uh, is it okay to have addition commands? I don't say to say that. Like everyone does that. Like you have, oh yeah, of course we're going to call the standard plus our compliance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, right. Well, yeah, but that is a secret sauce, right? So, so there's a logical reason for doing it, but plus doesn't. Yep. Right. So, so yeah, we, we're we're very anxious to see that come up. Whereas version two point one or something has has the whole device. And then going back to the original question, which was, uh, what is in there? Okay, do we actually need to include stuff? As detailed as uh, some sort of group parameter to support, uh, some sort of real time, you know, more detail, you know, hey, my, my local agency has something to do with uh, right. uh, how far and how, how far you go with that. So, all right, so it, it sounds at least like there's some interest in doing that, that um, pursuing it, right? So, um, we can definitely add that onto the agenda. Or um, some of the remote calls and see if we can't plug something out right and uh, we come back to the uh, workshop and then uh, present that as, as what, what's going to be for 2.1. So, um, so let, let's, let's, let's do that, right? So that'll be one thing that we'll add on the agenda is kind of determine what the protocol will be for our, for our power infrastructure. Sound, sound good? All right. Um, so that, that's great. Uh, what, what other kind of things? Driving forward related to power subsystems. <laughs> um, the, uh, the the server industry and the network uh, switch industry have a standard uh, power supply grid format. The common is CPRS. I don't know what CPRS stands for. Uh, but basically, every piece of the network here and the server basically have the same 105 by 40 millimeters. CRPS. CRPS. So that is 73.5 by one. Yeah. 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 So, you know, right? Um, OCP needs to charter and perhaps, you know, uh, 
basically get someone to build a 12 volt pass through and a positive, positive 48 to 12 volt power module so that uh, we as customers and, and hanging computing as an integrator can buy an off the shelf um, Melamox switch, anybody's Ethernet switch, server equipment, put it in a rack and be able to plug it into the 12 and 48 volt plus bar um, for, for those sort of individual pieces of things that take that CPRF and CRP <coughs> uh, standard form factor. If we had a product that, and I've talked to multiple vendors, and we haven't talked yet, so um, I've talked to multiple vendors, they're all sort of like, well, yeah, we could do that. And, and we do actually, we did actually get one made for our Arctica switches uh, so that our Ethernet, our line of Ethernet switches are plugable directly into the total factory. But we're going to need something similar to positive 48, and it could be a better. Uh, a better design into this part targeted for positive 48 rather than trying to repurpose negative 48, which is wiring it backwards. Um, uh, so, Wait, well, I'm sorry, what was that protocol? CP? CRPS. CRPS. Okay. Common redundant power supply. Okay. So, I mean, all the big power supply vendors make power supplies that follow those standards. All right. makes it, uh, LIDAR makes them, uh, all, all the rest. Um, Delta, and they, but they're all, they're all common, but they're all special, right? Special. Like, oh, yeah, sorry, I can't sell you that because that's the one we specially put the firmware in for HP. That's the one we specially made for Delta. That's the special firmware for Delta. Right, so they're all exactly the same, they just all have special firmware. Well, you know, all right, fine, but if you have the base design, and it's plus 12 in pass-through, or 48 in pass-through, then, then I can go to Melix and I say, buy that power supply, put it in your switch, make your switch firmware, understand it. And I've got agreement and principle with people like Melamox um, and, uh, and others. So I, I think we have enough volume, we could get the equipment manufacturers to modify their PNC firmware and others to talk to that via the PM bus standard. So, so that would be that would go a long way to allowing us to integrate non OCP gear and tracks. The power from the bus car, which would be a huge advantage for the disaggregated power. Okay. All right. So, is that a discussion that we want to include in that same at the same time as that? As when? As, as the same discussion that we have related to uh, like SNMP or whatever protocol we use for. Yeah, I mean, they're all maybe they're same players, same right? Standards, but right? I mean, yeah, it's not it's not directly related to power, but it's something that as a community we should be talking about. I, I think as a community, I, I've been trying to do this as one company. Sure. Uh, one, sure. one lone voice in the wilderness. Yep. But, um, but as a community, if we all say, yes, that's what we want, we'll buy that, then I think we could get enough attention to actually get at least one person to make it. We only need one person to make it. Oh, you all this is right? Yeah. Exactly. All right, so that everybody feel that that's at least something that uh, should go on to our future agendas? Great. All right. So um, I'll I see. Just one thing. If you're talking about the power supply that goes in the load. Yeah. So then that takes the 48 to whatever you need. Mm -hmm. Well, 12 volt. I mean, that's what that CRPS standard is. It helps about 12 volt. And then 12 volt 10. Yeah, well, I was trying to put a question on that too. Um, you have 12 volt loads and 48 volt loads in the same rack. No, no, I, I'm talking about, I'm talking about, I want to buy, I want to buy a switch from Cisco. It has, if you look at the switch, physically it has a, a redundant power supply. And if I pull that out and I look at it, it's the exact same power supply as in my Dell server, as in the switch made by, you know, uh, Juniper or by anybody else, because the power supply industry has standardized on a common form factor for that AC input to 12 volt output power delivery. So what we need is a sheet metal box that has the same interior plug and meets the same mechanical spec as that CRPS power supply. So that I can take that AC power supply out, plug in a 12 volt pass through for a positive 48 to 12 volt. Um, because that power supply output is 12 volt. So 12 volt is to pass through to positive 48 and then now I have a piece of equipment that I can put in the rack and I can power from the disaggregated power shell in the rack. So it's just a it's just a pass through with the same form factor that's still the Yeah. 
And well, in the total case, we're in a positive 48, we'll have to convert to that answer. But, but we can do a better job of converting from positive 48. And, and many of those vendors have negative 48 voltage versions of these things, but firing it backwards is not a So primarily, we use them in switches. I, I have an entire line of one gig to 100 gig weekends with each few gig pair. Um, so that's where we primarily see the play. Uh, and I want to be able to extend that into uh, specifically no knocks, but it would be a few of that. However, once I've got it, it would be kind of cool to be able to pass that to a uh, user server. The, the challenge is with a standard 19 inch track mount server have that car plated or the eye was in the wrong place. Uh, space is not a problem because they're only even bigger than the army. Um, so I can and, and I actually build and ship racks that have half the rack is AC powered and the servers with no bus parts in the back and the bottom half of that bus parts and like this would be equipment. Um, but but the difference between front mounted connections, IO and rear mounted IO uh, gets in the way and plus the mix of AC and a little weird but if you have a very small cluster very small number of nodes. Uh, it's an interesting solution that we have to do. Um, so it would be kind of cool to be able to do that, but as a practical matter, reaching between the bus parts and plugging everything in the back of the server and then trying to pull a power supply out, that's some live global bus parts. These are not things that I really want to become exclusive. Um, but uh, taking a redundant power supply switch, plugging only one power supply in, because I already have redundancy in the power shelf. And, uh, and then powering that, that, that network piece of energy for the bus bar is absolutely a huge Because then it also means that we can power the rack from high voltage DC, high voltage AC, 277, whereas there, there is no, those, those CRPS power supplies won't be 277. My power shelf will, and it generates 12, and so now I can now I have 277 volt power generators, which otherwise would be really fine. Just going to add something very interesting. So you see the CRPS is usually the silver box, you usually go into like the server, right? Because you use multiple meters with that and power supplies. So are you saying is we can take the same CRPS velocity, extend it to this because here we're using a rack now with power, right? So that's like a three kilowatt power block, we make you know one U or one OU height and make it uh, 73.5 millimeter wide and define the power attributes to that. Uh, you see what I'm saying? I mean, the thing is, CRPS is on multiple power, 600 watts, 900 watts, 1200 watts, right? Yeah, so you, you would need to do, yeah, so, so you would need to uh, you need to survey the market. Most of the ones that I need are 450. Right. So, yeah, and, and, and the CRPS does come in different lengths for those different power levels. And so, yeah, you would need you would need to adapt to each of those different metal box sizes and power levels. Um, but we have bus bar connectors with a little 100 amps, 1200 watts. So, uh, and the CRPS is in that same range, 1200 watts down to 450 watts. So, I have one other question regarding this pass through. Um, isn't there a difference between the system of a server and a power supply regarding to status, things of that nature? I mean, how would you handle that? The, 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 the PMS standard. The PMS standard. It's already a standard, it's already implemented by the CRPS. 
And that's that's what we need as the if someone in the industry is step up and is is a module that has this the PM bus um, and uh, if that's what we want, and then you can go back to your suppliers and say, here's the power supply, it supports PM bus, just wipe this this manufacturer at the power supply. I mean, I've already proved in principle that it that it really does work, right? Because I took a null last switch, I took the power supply out of my Ethernet switch. Engineer for my switches, put it in and all that, it powers up and run. Yeah, it complains that it doesn't have any kind of power supply, but it works, right? Um, so, you know, it, not, no smoke came out. I didn't, I didn't damage anything. I didn't have to get a sledgehammer to get it to fit in or anything. I didn't have to use a sawzall. Um, and so, I mean, the standards work. And uh, we, just, we just have to, I have to have a consistent supply of the module that's, that's independent. And, Community. Okay, great. That's a great suggestion. Um, okay, the two great topics. Anybody else have something that they would like to see added on to the power engine that we've got going forward? Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand the topic. So, what do you have that topic right now? Uh, so we've got the uh, CRPS. Yeah, CRPS and then the defining the, the protocol, right, for the your operation. Yeah, so right at whatever scale we decide to agree. Sorry, those are the two topics that we got added to the power agenda. Okay, and I guess the um, a possibility of having a controller power channel in the same controller. For the battery, um, the possibility of an alternative architecture with more modern users on the top of the and you know, kind of a brand or find something to put in your name to make that part of it. Sure, yeah, that would make that simpler, right? Mm -hmm. Same with the boat. Yeah, so but that's how we're going to be the third top. Okay. okay. Is there some interest in anybody else want to participate in that type of discussion? Okay, fine. Right. Right. We can put that on the agenda as well. You mentioned SNMP, does it mean as well? Or, you know, this can't be good. We have a discount in Redfish, right? Um, I'm not right now, right? Okay. I, I, uh, I think it's a point of discussion. Yeah, exactly, right? I don't know where we end up. Um, Why not both? <laughs> Okay, anything else anybody wants to bring up? Oh. Are we, does online count? Um, yeah, one, one other thing is, is um, when we were looking at the current um, specification, um, in some places when they can really compare to that, we want to go to the board and we can go to the And so, um, one of the things that probably one of the services we want to do, um, what we'd like to do is cross the, the power supply certification so that we have to do work now and see if, if perhaps we can solve um, some of those things that might be part of the um, one, one example is, I think, we talked about talked about the amount of power that we drop on that device to a truck on the road. And I think most people in the room recognize that having power systems that put on as opposed to the whole time will make the system a lot simpler. The number of different otherwise we have one now because there aren't any power power that much. Um, but right now the way that the Um, when the telecom model was not in 2018. So the, the current load that you're putting on that system is much higher. And, <clears throat> and if you look at traditional 48 volt batteries, I think pop the 48 is going to be a good battery for the charge engineer. Um, so 42 volt operation is required to be able to run enough batteries. As soon as they take some of that, you're up to 48. And that's only 
Steve, can you hear this? Hello? I did Steve? get one online. Okay. So somebody wanted to, somebody said I can get to that. Can you hear me? Kaylee sent a note to him, seeing if they can. Okay. So we'll see if we can see that. We can have a one sided discussion on that. Can you guys hear me? I'm speaking. I got to, uh... Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Brian, let me see. Um, let me see. Brian Zanstecker. Okay. That's me. Can you hear me? Has he typed Hello? anything, Kaylee? Yeah. I can well, hear you online. So I think the other online guys hear me, but the room isn't hearing me. Speaking. 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 Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Brian, are you there? Yes. You can. Check, check, check. We... Nothing. Hello, 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 hello. Yeah, why is that? Can't hear me. Can I get to the full? They can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just left the message in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can try and dial in. Speaking. Okay. I'll I'll take a whack at typing this. 
Or we can actually hear you. Oh, you can hear me in the room now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, awesome. All right, that makes it easier. Um, hey, so uh, I, I wouldn't suggest consideration, you know, mostly for robustness purposes, of uh, incorporating some kind of um, you know power supply software firmware interface standards or hooks, um, and obviously this can be both in the software and hardware sense um, for the interface between the the power shelf and power supplies and the system and or rack and um, whatnot, but just standardization that uh, helps to um, help design as, and more importantly. Uh, qualify and test and enable reliability testing for the interaction of the, you know, typically software controlled uh, power supplies and and the, the load end and all that that has to uh, interact. So we're talking beyond telemetry, but control. So you're looking to kind of expand. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm sure just about any of you have, have developed any um, data center power supplies that are, um, you know, that, that have one or more microcontrols for full on digital, you know, loop control, not just for telemetry purposes, um, and has to interact with a system over, you know, SM bus, PM bus, whatever, um, any type of interface that, you know, it, it's extremely common. Um, to, uh, you know, for, for, for issues with that to, to be um, limiting in the development, um, you know, kind of critical path. So whether it be because the, the system software firmware folks haven't, you know, properly integrated enough uh, functional specification for the power supply or vice versa, the power supply doesn't have enough um, functional or software uh, specifications to make sure it's compatible with all the um, system and rack level, um, you know, uh, buses, DCIM and all that. Um, so the, the point is that uh, with, with some standardization um, that, that dictates the design uh, and, and subsequent testing, validation testing and all that, you're, 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 you're mitigating a lot of risk um, and enabling a, a faster process for qualification testing of what, what I've found to be a, a key, um, you know, critical path inhibitor on just about every front end development I've ever experienced with, um, with micros in it. Does that, does that help? Yeah, so... Um, I don't know how well you guys can hear that in the room. Um, so, I guess it sounds like kind of what he's asking for is more of the test protocol for interoperability. Yeah. Um, and then, as we go through the mind interoperability, to make sure that there's a, a, a test protocol associated with that as well. Um, is that a, kind of a good summary for what your, your request is? Yeah, for the most part, uh, and kudos to you for being far more succinct than I, um, but uh, also, uh, Making sure that it is specific to the that that software interaction and that yeah, there's continuity between the actual test and qualification part and the just the interaction of specifications. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I think that'd be a, a good topic that we can add. Part of that same football discussion, right? So, um, yeah, we'll definitely add that on to this as well. Thanks for your experience. Cool. Thank you. And uh, thanks for the AV support, since I know <laughs> not the easiest in the room. Oh, that, that's great. I mean, it's a lot of like a topic. All right. In that case, let's, uh, let's move on to Scott. <laughs> Which one is it? Yeah, it's external. It's got the, the, one. Uh, one the one we tried earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have to apologize. I've been running around. It's the first time I've been to the game store. We're just glad you're here. We 
we uh, we, we were well at this table, but yeah, no, so I decided to this one in instead. So, all right, um, you're not you weren't running, you weren't actually running, like if you were just straight ahead. <laughs> All right. So, um, I'm uh, Scott McCauley from Google, and um, unfortunately, my co-presenter wasn't able to make it, so it's just be me here. But um, we do have someone else in the back taking notes, uh, um, John Zippel, uh, one of our uh, open open compute program folks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if we have questions, uh, especially given some of the proposals of CRTS. This is this uh, has a lot of similarities to uh, stuff that we've been talking about. Um, so what I wanted to talk about here was it's really a, a tray level sort of solution that we're looking at in Google, and we're trying to um, use open rack compatible power distribution in the racks. But uh, we find there's a lot of compelling global payloads that we want to look at. And by payloads, I'm talking servers, uh, or boards, what have you. Um, but it's just a tremendous amount of effort. So, Ready? Switch. Oh, thank you. Um, so when we talk about flatbed, what is flatbed? It's like, I'm, we're going to call it a toolbox. We've got uh, a large number of potential small parts that for a given payload, you might need to implement. So that's going to include, um, got the, the, the female tray, or the sled, as it's called. We will definitely have to use that. That that is how we interface between the rack and this payload. Um, we've got at this point, you likely to come in various different widths of servers. So you might see micro ATX is one possible payload. You might see uh, full 19 inch wide you know, things that are uh, wider than a 19 inch rack. Other uh, boards that you have to use um, now. And we, we may have to um, both have a shielded or an open top trade design. Um, the next main component, okay, part of the toolkit, is going to be um, power supply. That's the power supply chain. Uh, at this point, we're looking at both 12 volt and ATX as likely. Um, fan seat sinks, all that sort of thing. That's another shim. That's a shim that goes between the devices on the motherboard and the data center environment. Everyone has, they have a different data center environment. They've got a shim. Um, and then, of course, there's for each payload, you'll tend to have small, small adapter cards. Um, key among them uh, for us will be the air temperature sensor. We'll talk about that later. So, sorry, Jackson. Oh, no, no, no worries. I, they're they're <laughs> not seeing it on the. the Live uh, thing, so okay. keep going. All right, so um, for a little more you know, detail here, what I've got is a top view of what flatbed would involve. And for us, you know, the, the outermost uh, square there is the top view of the tray. And on the right, we've got the cold aisle, you know, user IO, that sort of thing. Uh, and on the left, we've got the hot aisle, which is going to include uh, fans are going to be on the stack. Um, with the server or the payload to the right, get the cool air. You can see that we support the uh, open rack V2 airflow direction only. That's that's one of the issues with trying to take uh, old OEM assemblies and wedge them into a 48 volt rack. And sometimes there are airflow versus power flow um, conflicts. So, what we want to do is we want to strip down the payload to the PDA, making sure we've got all the bin slots, CPUs, and Sync pins, what have you, pointing in the right direction with the airflow, and then releasing this tractor PCB for the back of the tray as one of the main shims. We'll get more into tractor later, um, but it's, it's providing a great deal of the, 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 the heavy lifting of the um, top. We've got our 48 volt power input connector uh, in the back, and um, Taking that to the payload uh, um, 
couple other details. All these colored lines in here, those are cable connections. <laughs> and uh, that way it goes straight into the power connector. We're assuming a um, horizontal crosswalk for that. So some of the earlier discussions about vertical pieces. This is all applies for around 48 volt straight to a horizontal connector at the shelf level. So this, this try to slide on the shelf. Um, what else here? We've got a, you know, a couple of air temperature sensors. But let's let's move on to the next slide and talk about some of the noise features. Uh, for us, one one nice thing is uh, by using you know, this the 40 flow adapter here, we can cover those the mixes in the rack, the heterogeneous rack, and we've got 12 volt 48. And uh, it's harder and harder to uh, have like a, a completely homogeneous only one voltage. That's, that's one way we're going. Um, we go with incremental migration path. Um, we're, we're pretty excited about 48 volt racks. So uh, sticking with known payloads, so we you know, add a customer, internal customer, external customer that needs a 12 volt payload, 12 volt server. Um, this is likely to be uh, a real hit. Um, the other thing is we're trying to work in a lot of standardization. <coughs> Using open BMC with a consistent single point of access to the fan control and the power supply monitoring on that, that tractor PCB is uh, how we're looking to try and get more software release. So every tractor is more or less the same. In fact, we probably use the same tractor for multiple payloads. See if I've forgotten anything here. Yeah. That's pretty much it. I don't know. Is there any questions right off? What that implementation looked like? If we put that, put that one slide. <coughs> um, does this sort of make sense? Is, are, are there any gaps? A question on. <laughs> Good. Sounds like it's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's been covered actually already. Doing it so. Um, I guess, you know, if we move back to the motivations, um, we, I'm sorry, oh, no, no, um, yeah, so the, um, when I, when I talk about the, the faster implementation, um, you know, there is hardware implementation, you know, matching up payloads, getting cool and right and all that, um, one of the long goals of the we really want to speed up the software implementation of, uh, System monitoring at the data center level. So, uh, same DMC code, open DMC. Uh, that's really important to us going forward. That seems to be a major one fault. So, um, that's, an, that's a driver for, for trying to efficient for ECDA and we're trying to have a system design across a lot of different areas. And, um, yeah, I guess I mentioned before, we're, we're very excited about 48 volt racks. We can get to migrate to higher power levels. So we can get to the Let's move ahead. And um, we've got a couple of examples of how we can use flat that to quickly be configured. A couple different faster looking CPUs. And we've got the long skinny here, got the wider here. You get them into the more or less the same tray. Uh, it should be you know, those keys that we actually perform to be open mm -hmm. rack uh, maximum width and uh, the uh, height. We don't care so much about we can add height as needed. Um, we, can, we can pick a maximum tray depth, but we want to be able to use within that, within that outline and be able to use the same track on both of these. So we have that key figure, and that's where the Come in. So you'll, you'll expect to see one of these uh, long, deep, high, high calorie manufacturers, but we want to have, uh, we want to have um, lots of cables that carry on the So uh, let's see what else is an interesting thing out there. Um, it's likely that we might. 
to use either micro APX, you like to have a narrow tray, it may be two across in an open uh, rack. Uh, we probably for that case be able to use the same tray. I guess the other, the other thing, uh, one advantage of this is when we're operating at scale, getting that reuse, reuse of the same components across multiple payloads is a big helper, not just for design time, it's also help uh, for production and for uh, service errors. You've got to be able to repair these things on site, uh, stocking all sorts of different service errors for each uh, individual snowflake, if you will, a, a payload that's painful. So we're, we're trying to push everything. It's the same fan across multiple threads and multiple payloads. Okay, let's go once more. So we're looking at the proposing specification for flatbed, or for flatbed. Uh, and I want to say that flatbed capability, that's uh, our flatbed specification. That's more about high level capabilities necessarily than the detailed implementation. I've actually been hearing a lot about, well, it's, it's very important to kind of nail down that implementation a little bit as well. So I think we're going to be having to take some, some uh, inputs to figure out how much detail is appropriate. Um, but at, at this early stage, I want to keep the implementation fairly open and at least nail down the architecture and some of the key IOs, very much like um, the, the open rack V2. So, uh, what's the, you know, the, the first level of, of interface that we want to cover, like the IO, if you will, would be, that would be open rack V2 mechanically compatible. Uh, we've got to come up with a set of, we call them test specifications, very much like the power supply shelf test specification, so that uh, an individual uh, customer can specify, hey, I've got a data center such and such a, an ambient temperature, I want to know for sure that this tray and this rack cool on my server and that's how. So we've got to we've got to come up with test specifications so that people can show these things for open rack to do these various configurations. Okay. Um, factor PCB itself, that has a number of IO or, or, or high level functionalities that have to be specified, but at a high level. So got to have a hot spot. Cable connection, open rack, um, and the thermal control path is very important as well, as well as a yeah, standard interface uh, that the uh, motherboard payload can And then there'll be some server motherboard minimum requirements, a uh, variety of uh, requirements uh, we've been coming up with, but we need to look for other people's. So, um, so Highlighted, yeah, no, I'm sorry, on the previous slide. Yeah. Um, speaking from personal experience, you're missing one thing, which is your front panel power reset and status LEDs. We are, yes. You're going to need, I mean, your tractor PCB A should come with, yeah. uh, should come with a, a standard front panel interface, one that has the power to reset the power on LED, on that BSC ID LED. If you're going to use any generic off the shelf motherboard, or not, you, in some of your previous slides, you showed where you sort of expect to have a reset button on the back of the board. Most of the boards don't have that. They have a front panel header. Uh, it might be an SSI standard header. Yeah. Um, and But they're going to expect that the, those buttons and no, the nice. lights are on the front <coughs> panel, which is right out of the rear rear. Yeah. And so, including your, tra in your tractor spec, a, a spec for a small PCB that would have a special yeah. place in the chassis that would have the power reset. Our LED and, um, uh, and the testing, the BNC ID. So, so you can blue, yeah. you can blue LED, yeah. 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 All, the, all, the, all the sort of, uh, yeah. I, that's, that's a really good question. I hadn't, um, I mean, hadn't gotten sort of the, the full path yet, but we had so far left that out of the tractor, um, using the tractor strictly as a back end device and assumed that <coughs> rather than status new tractor, you might have a payload specific front end. That isn't as generic. 
Um, so the BMC, I, I think that's a very good input to, to it state a through tractor. We don't necessarily have a hook to find yet. Set. Mm -hmm. you know, well, so, and it, it might be a separate board that's not put yeah. into the tractor, but it should be part of the spec of here are the, here are the electrical components. Yeah, you buy it for adapting this generic box shelf board into your yeah. Form. It, it might be easier to put that on a bracket up closer to the front. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this actually, as a side, this, I don't want to move on too quickly, but, you know, we could call that a different board, you know, maybe uh, a tab or something. The, the, the whole flatbed naming scheme is all about, <laughs> it's truck based. So we've got, you know, we've got a payload or cargo that we're carrying on a big flat tray. And then the tractor is, that's where the power supply goes, the engine goes, pulling the thing along. So, yeah, I mean, there's some intelligent user I go. I think that's a steering wheel. All right, so uh, on, on mechanical, uh, we're, these are just a couple of highlights we're, we're sort of looking into uh, internally, trying to figure out how we would use them. Uh, we want to cut down wherever possible on the number of um, individual tray designs. Uh, so that's going to tend to, for, for some subset of inputs, find a hard load paper with a fan bar. Flexible cable attachment uh, and uh, works to uh, different payloads. Um, on the uh, heat sink uh, side of things, we uh, feel that probably the best way to go um, is going to be to stick with my standard CPU attachments, uh, trying to use vendor reference designs, vendor specific CPU reference designs, as a uh, good statement of sand. Where do those socket retention points go? And can we get heat sinks or cold plates that use those same retention points? Uh, so we can cut down the number of heat sinks used for a given CPU. We might have a two socket or a four socket or a one socket payload. Hopefully, you can use all the same heat sinks for all of those, or at least you can. Go to off the shelf options because they should already be available. That may result in flatbed ending up you know, taller, taking up more slots than it would for an optimized design. So there's, a, there's potentially very, very much thermally driven, you can imagine. There's going to be a patent on you know, how you're racking. But um, you know, that's one of the prices we're, we're looking at paying for the rapid. On the next one, <coughs> and, uh, on the thermal control, uh, one of the things we're doing, this, this started out as really a power exercise, but it became um, apparent very quickly that uh, software was a big aspect of it and thermal control. So um, we definitely you know, fully committed to front to back airflow, no funny bends, no uh, nothing like that. Just keeping it simple so it's very easy to simulate move from design concept into implementation. Um, we believe that we want to control a large number of fans and uh, independent air control. So again, this is part of the whole idea where we want to be able to shim between payload requirements with that individual dies that you have to the BMC and go and read those die temperatures. Uh, but we've also got a data center uh, environment that you've got to respect. Maximum air temperatures, uh, you want to get a certain air temperature monitor. Uh, and that's why we're, we're big on in several remote air temperature sensors, tabled up to wherever locations you find the need to maintain that, that, that shim interface between the payloads chips and the data center. Um, and then uh, we're <coughs> definitely sticking with the idea of. BMC, that's your thermal master. That's the one that's speaking all the way. I'm not trying to move that on the tractor or anything like that. Tractor is just a hand control resource and a thermal sensor control. Um, that's about it for this one. So let's move on to uh, some of the 
some of the server requirements. Um, I'm just going to jump over these really quickly. This, is, this isn't exactly the server track. So. Uh, <laughs> but if anyone has any questions or thoughts, um, definitely take some uh, interest here. Um, we are talking about you know, going up to very wide widths in the tray. Um, not necessarily standardized, but the basic idea is we're going to use the OpenRAC V2 mechanical uh, as a uh, guideline for what's our maximum. Depth of the server trays or depth of the or in the motherboards. Um, these are some guidelines based on what it looks like and reasonable tractor layouts will do for you or, or how much left room is left. Um, and reasonable tractor capabilities. So it's not a not a terribly large motherboard, but it's you get pretty large motherboards in there. And um, I should say we're looking for a very simple layout. There are all sorts of crazy mechanical tricks you can do to create these things in Titan, but uh, for simplicity and speed of deployment, uh, the first focus is going to be probably shallow racks and, and simple co planer layouts where there's a server in front and tractor in the back. Besides that, not, not too much. Um, I'm not sure we can get reasonable, consistent airflow direction. And there may be challenges with some of the user IO connectors. They may not be at the front, particularly in the PX architectures. But they're not really made for a trade application. So there may be a lot of cabling or potentially some crazy stuff. Go on here. Uh, electrical requirements. Uh, we're thinking the PCI slots. Um, we really like to have at least PCI slots, PCIe slots. That uh, don't have any unusual usage reserved things. You know, if you've got a standard unit, standard something or other, you want to be able to slide it in there and not have trouble interfacing with it. Um, for, for management purposes, um, we want this uh, NCSI connector. Um, where one of the more interesting requirements um, talk to the power supplies to get that monitoring. Perhaps over PM plus, we need to ask. We need to have a connectorized or connector on the payload where the PMC itself can reach out and talk to our resources on track. Uh, we're not looking for a remote management capability. So um, this is kind of it's kind of a big one. We've had trouble in the past with um, on the show here where if there's an SM bus that has Various devices <coughs> on the server that are uh, have address conflicts with what we want to put on that SM bus starts getting difficult to work around. Um, so we have a couple of workarounds, but we're going to be trying to only pick payloads that have clean address space and connector on the SM bus. Uh, we'll talk about that that interface to the back and forth over there. Um, and the payload is going to have you know, see. Be able to the Linux, it's got to be able to work with the Linux. It's got to be able to work with the Linux. It's got to be able to work with the Linux. Besides that, we've got a couple different power input options. And we want some compliance uh, as part of that, just to, to smooth our path into the world. All right. So, uh, last thing I'll get to is uh, uh, Tractor PCB. So, what's that path? Uh, of course, it's got the open rack V2. Style connector <coughs> cable coming into uh, input using hot swap. Uh, and we've got easy to easy converters who are whatever our load requires. Right now we're going to split it into two main categories multiple volts or an APX. And then uh, we've got a fan control connectors. So uh, in this factor, it's going to be a slave for fan control. Handle RPM and temperature monitor, or say RPM controlling and temperature monitoring for the EMC. So a single consistent interface from payload to payload platform to platform. Uh, how would you just pass through the fan control headers from the motherboard? We can't necessarily guarantee that any motherboard has enough fan control headers to, uh, or for that matter, has enough independent terminals. Uh, Fit well with our 
Let's say I want to have a couple different pair zones. Uh, pulling one aggressively and not pulling one, another one aggressively. Uh, I look at like an ATX motherboard. It's going to play well. We're just trying to cut the risk that we, we run into a situation where we've got to cut custom software or, or come up with some custom adapter. So we're building an extra capability, potentially some extra complication, um, but it's really just so that we have Again, there's a tax associated. Is it large? It may be. You know, the connectors on three. Uh, the the, bigger, the bigger problem is this, you, you now mandate you have to write your own DMC program. Yes. Yeah, you are. You can just let the motherboard do its own fancy control, which it does perfectly well. Yeah. You now, you now signed yourself up to writing OpenDNC and you're requiring OpenDNC, yes. uh, which is great. I mean, yeah. you're a software company. You've got tons of software engineers yeah. that would love to write software yeah. to run on hardware. Yeah. But but if you're yeah. if you want if you want to make this grease, you know, grease and right. just send it in, you don't want to you don't want to have to wait for them to write that. You don't want to have to have them write that. So that's a that's a really good point. We don't have an abstract, we don't have a plan to go around. And use the. I, mean, I, I can't say they couldn't just connect the fans in the tray up to the standard motherboard connector. You can certainly do that and just ignore the flatbed. Then the tax is, well, it's not that you're getting half usage out of the fan. Or you can design a simpler factory that doesn't have it. Right. Like the whole process could be simpler. Yeah. And I can tell you it works because I'm doing it. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, so <laughs> I guess we'll have to negotiate between our software folks and, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. you want to cut, you know, for all these different DMCs or, you know, different you know, special releases or, yeah, it's, it's flexibility and um, I think we will end up eventually playing a bunch of stuff option games. But, yeah, it's, when we do that, we trade off you know, large numbers of students and then you get pushed back from the folks who are not supporting. Um, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough one. Good point. You should uh, call out the possibility of uh, streamlining things, running things directly off the of DMC. Uh, definitely cheap. Okay. All right, let's move on. And so, uh, just a quick scan through here. We've got a couple of options. Pull up, like, how would we make a powertrain for uh, an ATX compatible? So we, we've got a trade connector with a cable. Uh, the tray connect from the horizontal bus bar, go into a hot swap, uh, out of the hot swap and split into a pair of uh, very standard isolated uh, IDC bricks. These are off the shelf items. We've got many different power levels. Um, most likely, we'll try to reduce the skews of a, a tractor that has APX outputs. We'll just pick one brick. Um, the cost difference between different bricks is relatively small compared to what we believe is the cost of missing a market window. So um, as, as uh, one of these things progresses, we may go into higher degree blocking. So some isolated converters, some options on those, and we'll probably stick with the same sort of bucket. These are the things we're going to have. Let's go to the next you know, flow hold. Uh, very similar, you've got rid of the APX outputs, and then you've got both local commands here. You're likely to need, well, you're likely to get good performance if you're about two or maybe three of these IDCs together. Beyond that, the benefits fall off very rapidly. The transit response to the issue uh, is you share. So uh, if you need to go above, like a two kilowatt sort of uh, 12, 12, 12 volts, you're looking at probably making separate islands. Which again pushes another uh, line onto some of those payloads. Let's say we have a, a server payload that's more than two kilowatts, blows out. <laughs> but uh, uh, it would be very helpful if those islands are separated on the server payload so that you only have to have hooked in parallel boot share, maybe two to three bricks to supply that two kilowatt. So let's see, do we have anything else? I guess 
this is the one uh, in the, the previous diagram we looked at first. It looks like, oh, yes, is the polycytosis on the compound a big deal? Yes. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, for the first prototypes, I'm anticipating this to be a stop option. We're going to experiment and find out what software wants to support. But it will come from the BMC, uh, either the, the, there's the ATX power on signal, um, or possibly, I, I think that this is a little less reliable, uh, an I2C expander. So basically, you have a set of 12 volts, 12 volts, 12 volts Yes. Yes, we do have Oh, oh okay. Let, let me let me add to this. It's not shown here as a sequence. Um, so there there is a sequencer. Uh, we intend to hold standby running at all times, but I have here an alternate path. Uh, I call this you know it's like a, it's a big hammer when something really goes wrong. This is this is how you, you can issue a command to shut down the power to cycle it, but it comes back up. So um, this is this is not looking at a, um, an architectural change to open rack v two, but there's a control signal coming in from a rack monitor. This is each tray managing itself. If the uh, if a certain user, a certain customer, or whatever needs a larger hammer, more effective hammer, a power cycle via sequencer that can control these, then we, we could set up a monostable, cycle the power down, and it comes back up. And so that's it's an option. We haven't haven't finalized that yet, but it's very likely to be a stuff option. Um, all right. And what else have we got? Oh, okay, this this gets into the um, control and communication system. So in the diagram of the chart that we had earlier, there was a bottom block that was a DC a DC power train. This is the top block where a lot of the work is controlling the fans and the thermal. So what's going on on the left is what we call the comms connector. That is cabled across to the BMC. Um, we need the I squared C port. We set we can get a DPIO, that's an option coming in there. Um, we've got an alert going back and potentially a BMC IO or GPIO we can get to one. Um, we've got Power supply on power okay is functions because those are often very common on PDX or other servers. Uh, we just run those to the sequencer. And then we're taking that I squared C bus coming in and we're setting up both tractor PCDA resources. So I have a new from the sequencer, uh, the fan control, all the fan control, uh, and then the monitoring of so PM bus. Those are just basically cable brake sensors and expansion connectors. Not the things we have the bottom yet. And uh, one other thing to note here is that uh, if it was felt that we need to have a faster interrupt driven response, uh, we can do interrupt aggregation to run the standards and drive an interrupt directly back to the BMC. So that cuts down the uh, interrupt servicing time to actually see you know which device to go in. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if we don't have a clean ice squared C bus, uh, we have a workaround looking at um, XOR I squared C or XOR based address translation for the I squared C address system. Um, that one would be much rather have a clean ice squared C bus, but we're likely to put in that, that additional Questions on this one? And then if we go on to the last one, we're going to talk about some of the software. And again, uh, I'm very excited about OpenDMC and, and looking at it. Uh, I think there's a lot of OpenDMC uh, activity. And um, we're, we're definitely looking at getting Tractor to get uh, support, supported in OpenDMC. Um, make it easier. We want to keep that consistency between Tractor version and between flatbed trays. So uh, we want a very similar tree on all these things, if not an identical on the C tree, um, so the code doesn't have to change very much at all. It's just cable-based changes. Uh, and, uh, let's see, if we do have some performance 
this. Uh, he needs future version of flatbed, or we want to support payloads without DMCs. Uh, if you go back to the, <coughs> to the last slide, we're looking at we could potentially take that block out and do rest translation, and we could throw in a microcontroller in there. So that microcontroller can be expert T slave on one side, expert T master on the other, with a whole bunch of table based uh, or, or going out and servicing all the resources here and presenting a table of um, the equivalent of BMC or no BMC. Some of the high level monitoring for it. So that's all I've got, except for the last slide with the, the questions. <coughs> and I guess we've already got that. That's that's really difficult. So um, I'm wondering if there were any other questions or areas I might have forgotten. Yeah. We go back to the page number four. Okay. That's this this one right here? Yeah. One one more? Oh the first one. This one? Yeah, this one. So that's the physical is that the physical location of the farm? Ah. So the uh, what we're anticipating is this tray slides onto a um, 48 volt ORV2 shelf. That shelf has a horizontal bus bar that runs across it so that um, the bus bar is going to run all the way down here. And we can move this connector to be over here. It just so happens on this drawing. And um, yeah, I, I like this corner. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that corner. <laughs> Are you sure? I thought Google's design was your servers were mounted vertically, and so you have a horizontal tray. The horizontal bus bar, that connector is always located half an inch off the bottom of the server. Yeah. Is it, they, the, server, the PCB is actually mounted vertically, not horizontally. Ah. It is in the we, of the now, the open, open rack, we, you know, I guess open rack could support that because it's kind of agnostic. But um, at this point, you, know, you, can, you can make an argument why CPUs, it's, it's nice to have the CPUs flat because you can get better heat sinks. You know, these evaporative heat sinks that, that work nicely on a sort of flat server. So uh, I, I would say we're likely to be more of a um, flat, you know, sort of traditional tray with a server on it. Um, there are a large number of, on the web photographs of, you know, like inside of Google data centers. You can take a look at some of those to see some of the um, flat tray organizations. Yeah, but that's like three years old though. Yeah. I mean, last year when we heard when you were proposing your 48 stops, oh, did you intended to do, do these a horizontal vertical. Bars? Yeah. Did, did you intended to do horizontal bus bars and then okay. vertical bus bars, and then you would be mounting servers vertically, and there, therefore you wanted the ability to do variable heights because you would put the trays at variable heights and you would have all kinds of different heterogeneous uh, types of equipment with differing heights, uh, which is, you know, Dives with your discussion here, you're saying, yeah. uh, you know, you're showing three fans on this one, but then on the next slide, where you show a half width board and a, a full height yeah. board, those are clearly two different heights because they had different numbers of fans. Oh, no, actually, I'm sorry. I shouldn't, I should have made it the same. Like when I made this in the slide, I didn't do a very good job. I didn't put a ruler or anything but, like that. But you could also say you could make it wider or narrower, yes. but you can't really because you've only got 21 inches. So, so if, you, if, you make, yeah. if you make it 22, you know, if you make it 20 inches wide, you can't do anything with those other two inches. No, we only, inch. only have if you make one. It 16 inches wide, you can't do anything with those other four. We only have one real option in a, in a open rack T2 short width, and that's like full width. Um, um, we have a wider rack. Uh, three wide. Yeah, yeah. We do. <laughs> we do have an. It's, that's a very narrow tray. Yeah, yeah. but it's just wide it's enough possible. to have it four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, with with depth limitations, you know, with with a yeah, super narrow tray. If you inflicted that on yourself that's by going right. to a thirty inch <laughs> that's that's right. rack instead of sticking with exactly. everybody else's forty inch, yeah. you heard. I guess let me let me go back to <laughs> maybe the start the starting question, and I, I'm not sure I understood it correctly, but uh, I can say that uh, we intend to stick with the flat trays, although there is a you know you can you can have Machine trays that are vertical, like a, um, a networking blade or something like that. 
Uh, it looks, you know, I'm sure that it's been discussed, but um, I don't know, I think black trays are you know, the way forward here. For cooling reasons. And, you know, as one moves into liquid cooling. Yeah, no, we do that too. Yeah, then, it, then, then some, some, of those, some of those restrictions are removed. Because, you know, there's no, there's no evaporative gravity feeding back down to the same on positive chip. Yeah. So, uh, this is really a question, I guess, more of a comment. So, this, this, this initial description of the design says, check this out. We have these basic building blocks, and then there's all this flexibility. We have this in here, this in here, this in I think it would help, particularly with questions like this, like, well, wait a minute, why aren't you doing all the vertical things? Like oh, well, you've got specific same you can. Yeah. But you're starting off with more of a horizontal. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if the first step is to define maybe the, do the like 80 20 rule, right? Define the 80% of, of possible 12 volt devices <laughs> yeah, that you want to put on here, right? It's going to be two or three servers, a uh, switch or something. Or I don't know if they are. They have just a sample of what you consider will be 80% of the of, of what possibly would be in here. Because again, this whole thing only exists because you're trying to run four fold equipment on a 48 volt. Right. Right. Yes. So, okay, so what are those 80% of the bubble pieces of equipment that might qualify for here? And then define what their what their uh, what their outline is. Right? Yeah. That's so that's a good point. We and maybe you say, look, the only thing that could ever happen, you're never gonna Yes, we've got eight items, but you're never going to have all eight in one tray because it's just not logical, right? But once you know the list of eight items, in fact, what could often happen is, of course, you're going to have a server because that's the key. Or you have a switch, you could also have a server. I don't know. I'm going to stuff up, right? But by doing that, then it becomes more logical whether it ever makes sense to have to trade the end of the other full width or just half it. Yeah. I, that, that is an exercise we've been going through internally for, for some months now. As you can imagine, it's very difficult yeah, right. predicting the future. Um, the way the winds are blowing right now, it looks like um, 10 inch trays are good. It looks like 19 inch trays are good. Um, or, you know, I'm giving rough numbers, you know, half width and full width. Um, and uh, it looks like there's, you know, I mentioned the 12 volt bulk and the ATX. Those look like the two sort of power varieties we want. But yeah, there's a little bit of balkanization going on with the 12, you know, because it's like that that gets to be an expensive tractor board for, for really high power applications. So we're likely to have a couple SKUs. And um, so I guess the, the, the thing is, uh, where we are right now, we're still trying to decide. Or slicing it up makes the most sense. We, we put a tentative, a couple of tentative stakes into the ground, um, and it could really simplify things for the purposes of the specification. I've been hearing that there's a lot of um, open area specifications, and cutting down the degrees of freedom, you know, is yeah, really great. Yeah, just go well, 80%. Yeah. You know, we don't know what that other 20% is. It's yeah. going to be all the oddballs. Yeah, but by definition, you're not going to be all right, so maybe but, we, but actually going to the other point of like, well, why don't you just use the, uh, the fan headers on the, the server board? That's assuming you have a server board. Is that that is always something that's going to happen, or are you going to have some of these local products that don't actually need a server board? You're doing another thing. Yeah. For now, we'll call that an A because it looks like you know what what's interesting. It's, it's getting server fail. Yeah, so that falls in the end. So then, yeah, you can yeah. say, yeah, look, <coughs> okay. at least one server on here with different sizes. So maybe you can always use the headers for that. Stepping back a little is is like one of the uh, inputs maybe we're going to do in the specification. Um, rather than just have a couple of loose examples, have three or four uh, clear DMAR points of our 80% solutions and say, going forward, that might be flatbed. Like that is that is that something that might work for? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, 
sensors and the, the fairing I think that's that's definitely a given you know they start out first ones they uh, 3d printed and then when you're happy with it 
Yeah, you go like right. two. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Throw a little money up front. Get the information. Get it done. Yeah. Okay. Right. Any other questions or thoughts? Or? I, I uh, definitely want to uh, thank uh, everyone for all the other discussion. Uh, we will have education for first OCP. So here in the, uh, who's it, the uh, is it the guest thing? CRPS. CRPS. Looking at that and over that. Um, I guess one other thing we're, we're looking at um, trying to round up input. So if you can come up to me if you're interested, um, just like in contact information, uh, I'll talk to folks later online. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move forward. Thanks very much. So, I mean, that's all we've got on our agenda for today. Um, so we will be setting up, because the backlog that we've got right now, we'll be setting up some uh, monthly meetings starting next month. And we'll be scheduled for the second Wednesday of each month for um, uh, an hour or two, depending on how much stuff we can cover. Um, and then we'll start at 9 a.m. on the West Coast time. <coughs> so going forward, that'll be kind of the, the at least a monthly meeting that we set up. You know, I set up additional meetings on top of that. Topic uh, that we don't necessarily need to come across. Uh, can't necessarily wait that long. Uh, so that, that has already been set up. If you go to the OCP uh, website, um, you look down there and the right power. Better set up, so um, I'll first turn that out on the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, filter as well. Uh, but that's where you find it. I'm not logged in. Um, and based on the uh, uh, what we have set up here related to power, um, maybe we want to set up a separate in time um, time uh, uh, for each of the states. Power specific uh, discussion. Uh, so we may want to consider setting up a uh, subgroup open for the deadline power. Uh, but that's something you guys do talk about that next uh, next uh, uh, remote meeting. And then based on the agenda level, right, if there's somebody that uh, wants to volunteer to kind of drive um, that power subgroup, then uh, let me know. Uh, so, uh, so that's it. Thanks, guys, for coming out. I appreciate it.